Hey everyone, for today's build guide I'm going to be covering the Fairy Knight. The Fairy Knight is an Old Faith Arcanist you recruit during Act 3 through the story. When you recruit him it's actually an option, you have to choose between either him or Sir Gawain. Gawain being a defender and you having Sir Mordred being required for all story missions and they're just being really good alignment lock defenders you get. Gawain generally gets cast aside for Fairy Knight as Fairy Knight's also just a lot cooler. He's by far the more popular pick of the two, at least in my experience and based on all the players I've talked to. And the draw is really that he's just a very unique Arcanist. You can see here at a glance his skill tree, lots of stuff unique to him, or just has a lot of stuff sort of shuffled around. He really does slot into sort of a lot of different roles you can have him go. So this sort of flexibility and versatility really is a draw for him. It makes him very fun to play. I don't think he's really even in contention for one of the strongest Arcanists. I mean, that's still probably, you know, Merlin, Morgana. But he's still very effective and, like I said, what I think is more important, he's very fun. Now going into Essences, you can see I only have one on him. I wasn't using him a whole lot in my playthrough, so I didn't really prioritize essences towards him. I put them elsewhere, but one that I knew for sure that was always going to go on him is the essence of dodge. He has two dodge skills within his skill tree, so with this essence, he actually has a 40% dodge chance. That's almost half. You'll see him dodging multiple attacks directed at him in a single round, pretty consistently too. So his survivability is actually pretty high, especially for an Arcanist. It may sound weird, but because of this dodge chance and some other abilities we'll get to, he actually makes a pretty decent off tank. Going in a sort of opposite playstyle direction, I don't have it on my Fairy Knight, I have it on another hero for this run, I would actually recommend the Essence of Mutilation. I think Fairy Knight makes a very good secondary damage dealer. You know, he's not going to be putting out, you know, main damage dealer numbers like a Vanguard or like a Champion. But with this essence, I think hitting those 10% chances, if you really do want to use him, giving him that jump really does elevate his damage potential really well and narrow that gap a bit more. Now beyond these two, those are the main ones I would definitely suggest for any Fairy Knight user if you're going to be using him consistently. The last two are definitely sort of flexible depending on what you think your Fairy Knight needs, you know, flex essences. For this one in particular, I do think an Essence of Constitution would be a good pick. You can see he has no physical debuff resist baked into his skill tree, so giving him that 50% I think is a significant boost for him. And then for a fourth slot, it's really up to you. He's a very flexible unit, so his essence applications are pretty broad. As for how I'm building him, those are very much optional and team dependent as well, whatever your comp is. Starting with gear, I think there's two ways you can really kind of build him, or try and go both at the same time if you want him to kind of be a middle of the road, either into damage. And if you're doing damage, you want stuff that provides bonus damage to duels and bonus damage to backstabs. He gets into these situations very easily, can enable and set up these situations very easily, and he's going to be doing a lot of damage this way. Alternatively, you can build him more defensively if you want him to be kind of more like an off-tank. And as I mentioned before, he's actually pretty good at being an off-tank. If you're doing this, you're just looking for defensive stats really in general. And... This first armor piece, I think, is a good example of that. If you want to go the off-tank route, this is, like, pretty much the best item I think you could get for that. The Hexmark of Vigilance. It has extra defensive stats. You can see plus 9 HP, plus 3 armor. So this is actually some high raw stats for a medium armor in general. But then those first two abilities, one hit, always turn towards the attacking unit. This is the stuff you usually want to see on your defender. This way he won't be getting backstabbed. This is also useful if you're using him offensively. You teleport in to kill a unit, you know, in their backline, all of a sudden their units converge on him. Gets surrounded very easily. Well, now he's relatively safe, won't be taking backstabs. The second line on this item, though, 
definitely does hurt him offensively, but is actually really good as an off tank. When you hit an enemy with melee, they become taunted. Taunting is great as an off tank. As a backstabbing assassin damage dealer, not so much, because when you taunt them, they will actually turn to face you in the middle of your turn. They immediately turn around so that you're no longer getting backstabs. For his weapon, Hexed Rune of Might, this one I think is great regardless of how you want to build him. I do think this one is a bit better towards that assassin kind of gameplay, but honestly, for a staff, I'm not sure how much of a tanky staff you could get for him. So this may just be really good in both playstyle directions. Ultimately, that first line you see there, the execution ability. If your attack would leave them below 15% health, or vitality, they just die. This actually does enable him to get a lot more kills this way. There's a lot of times where I'll hit an enemy and they will die because of the execution. So his ability to secure kills is actually fairly high with this weapon. I see it come up a lot, Cooling Strikes I believe is the text that'll pop up to let you know that this execution procced. I see it a lot when I use my Fairy Knight. And then Knockback pushes enemies a further one tile. This is really good because he does have a Cleave Knockback move, which is great for protecting himself if he is getting surrounded and you don't have Teleport off of cooldown, or if you're using him as a tank and you just want to get him away from your squishy backliners, you know, your more traditional Arcanist or a Marksman or your Sage. And then just a flat plus 8 weapon damage, this just gives him a really high base damage for all of his skills to scale off of, so this is just good in that way as well. Now for my jewelry pick, this one is definitely a personal taste sort of thing. There's definitely other items that you can get that will be better towards just boosting his damage outright, for example. But I actually like this one because it grants him a second teleport skill. You may think it's weird having two teleports, but teleport does have a cooldown of two, and the teleport from this ring can be used once per encounter. So basically what that means is I can teleport one turn and then do whatever it is I want to do with that teleport, kill something, act defensively, and then teleport again if I still need to, or on the next turn, if I'm in an oh shit situation, whether for himself or I need to get him to an ally to help them out, I have this emergency backup teleport. It doesn't really help boost his damage dealing directly or his defensiveness directly, but granting him this extra form of uh, excellent mobility, I think does indirectly help boost either of those playstyles. This last item, definitely not great. You can definitely find better. As I mentioned before, I wasn't using the Fairy Knight a whole lot in my run, so I wasn't keeping a careful eye out for gear that would be good for him. I mean, I still have missions left in this playthrough, so I could maybe find something better, but I don't think it's a big deal if you're trying to min-max. This is not what you want to end up with. But what I have here is two extra AP on that first turn, lets him, you know, do something on that first turn if I want him to. Extra damage for Force Bolt. This I actually kind of do like because he does have Force Bolt and gain some extra HP if hitting a Hexed unit. This actually does kind of come in handy for him with how I play him. And then some Mental Debuff Resist, capping out at that 88%, making him very resilient to things like stuns. Going into skills, you can see he has a lot of abilities that are unique to him as an Arcanist, and just a lot of other Arcanist abilities are swapped around. Off the bat, you'll notice he only has two hexes, and I didn't even take one of them, and I didn't take any hex intensity upgrades. I'm not using him as a more standard Arcanist, so I'm not using his hexes nearly as much, and their effectiveness boosting their hex intensity also not a priority. He is essentially a melee character, so that is what I am focusing on. For his basic attack, it's a melee attack, but it does have a range of 2, which I think is a nice touch because he is using a spear, makes sense that he has extra range. 75% weapon damage. Not super high, but with the first upgrade we can get that up to 90% with his 50% buff. Have it apply shock, so defensively we can use it to tag multiple enemies to reduce their ability to attack us on the next turn, or if you're using him assassin style, if they survive your attacks, their ability to fight back will be diminished as they will have less AP. Reduce the cost by one, so now this is a 3 AP attack, which is great. 
and increase the damage against armored targets. This is really good. It actually encourages you to go after those armored targets. We're taking Teleport, of course, that's very key to his playstyle, especially if you want to lean into that Assassin playstyle. We don't take Astral Journey, it's just too small to be impactful, but we are reducing the cost as usual, increasing the range as usual, and Shadowgate, so now he can get surprise bonuses. Magical Armor is great for any off-tank. If you saw my Lucan build, you'll know how strong this is for an off-tank. Just a whopping 29 bonus armor for two attacks. And increasing his base armor, you notice he has 22. That's extremely high base armor for an Arcanist. Increasing his weapon damage. And then you're obviously going to want to keep this talent that enables him to have medium armor. He starts with it by default, but he has some not great talent picks. In his sort of default version, when you recruit him, you're going to want to respect him. Force Bolt for him is actually a tier 2 ability. I do pick this up with none of the upgrades just so he has... A range option because sometimes there is just a unit that's super low and he can't get to and I just want him to shoot him to either get the kill himself or set up the unit for a kill from one of my other heroes. Slowing Hex is just I think one of my favorite debuff and crowd control maneuvers. It greatly hampers a lot of units trying to get to my party and I can also use this offensively as a setup. You'll notice we want it to be that amazing 1 AP cost, but I also put the vulnerability debuff upgrade on it. So now, for one cheap AP, I cast it on a unit he's about to attack, and now he's doing a little bit of extra damage. And because of this item I have here, they are hexed, so he will get some HP back from hitting them if he is missing some. So, this is just a great sort of little bit of combo enabler. He has Ice Shield, which is also amazing. Just like Lucan, really helps his off-tank potential. With all of the upgrades, he has four ice plates that orbit him for four turns. And that means he's basically just going to eat four attacks that would hit him if they hit him because he has the 40% dodge. And then once they get past the ice plates, he then has this huge amount of armor through magical armor they need to eat through. So you can see he just has layer upon layer of defense that really make him much more durable than he may first seem if you're just looking at these raw stats and what class he is. Super cheap, 1 AP cost, cooldown of 4, but like I said, it does last for 4 turns, so if they don't eat through other ice shields, this can have pretty close to 100% uptime. We're taking long reach. This does boost Force Bolt a bit, this does boost Slowing Hex a bit, but it does also boost Teleport, and I think that is most important. Then here we can see we have his two dodge chances, you definitely want these. He has Fire Blast, which you'll recognize from Ector, but for him it's tier 3. I just take this as a little bit of extra AoE damage. AoE damage is always useful, enemies do group up a lot, so this is just his way of helping contribute to burning down clumps of enemies. This doesn't get used a lot, but it does come up, and it is nice when it does. Here we have melee expertise, something you really only see on champions otherwise. And we're taking this, of course, because of Killing Spree. That one free extra attack when he kills something. This does come up fairly often. Archers will stand next to each other, or just melee units will stand next to each other. You kill one, especially with this execution move off the staff, making it easier to get the actual kill, meaning it's much easier to get these killing spree free hits. It, it's huge. You won't see him chain killing quite as much as like a champion. Last thing I'm going to cover is force cleave. This is just like regular cleave, same type of targeting, except this also provides knockback. This does have a nice and very low cooldown of one, so you can use this every single turn if you like, with this upgrade, reducing the cooldown by one. It is. It does cost more AP, it costs 5 versus 3, so you want to keep that in mind. With this upgrade, extra 10%, and applying a 20% vulnerability debuff. This actually has knockback of 2, because of that staff we have. So, this is just a huge amount of space you're creating for yourself or for your allies. I don't use this really offensively a whole lot, unless there's just, you know, 3 enemies lined up in front of me, and I don't have enough... AP to, like, you know, kill one of them. I'll use this and just hit all of them. And it's great defensively as an off-tank to create space for your squishy units. So for this first fight, we're going into Blood Rites, level 24. It's a Fomorian Picked mission. 
You can see I don't actually have a defender with me. Fairy Knight's going to be kind of acting as my primary tank here, and everyone else is going to be kind of running crowd control. So first things first, we're going to Ice Shield, slow this picked warrior, and then we're going to throw some traps out with uh, Bedivere. And we're just going to go ahead and pass. I guess uh, we're going to keep him close by because we're going to have a lot of guys coming in soon. All right, cool. Got him kind of grouping up here. So let's throw down some AoEs. That's why I like to keep this fire blast. Then we're actually going to teleport in get the kill on this, get the free attack, and then we're actually going to teleport back, put them yeah, right in front and center, basically asking people to hit him. Oh, must have just left him outside that 15% to get the execution. That's okay. Um, we can inspire, and, uh, course correct. There you go, got it that time. Pull back. Traps. There's the Nollywood Sassfors. Where'd you be? Pretty right. I don't think any of them actually attacked him. <laughs> okay. That's fine. That chain kill. Here's actually a good spot to force cleave, so we're gonna do that. Um, Alright. He used rage, got a hit in, dodged. Not that it would have really mattered, we had our four ice shields up damage wise, but. Because of the dodge, we still have four ice shields up. We're going to teleport behind. Swing, taunted. Swing, I mean, you're frozen, so it doesn't really matter that much. Let's go ahead and refresh our ice shields. There we go. Came out of that with only a little bit of damage on Isolde, but Fairy Knight completely unscathed. He didn't get too many attacks directed at him because our party was really strong at doing our crowd control, but out of the ones that were directed at him, he dodged them all. This second fight is going to be against some Fomorians, so, you know, very beefy enemies. Lots of armor, lots of health, some pretty high damage too on some of them. Yeah, you can see this is a lot. So, we're going to just position our Fairy Knight up in front. Basically saying, attack me. Alright, that should be good for turn one. We're just gonna pass and see what they do. Alright, he did an AoE line attack, I think that was, so that did hit, that does bypass things like dodge, does th bas uh, bypass things like ice plate, so that does count as one of our magical armor hits. But you can see he was completely fine, didn't actually take health damage because his armor is just so absurdly high. They're playing pretty defensive, so I don't really have much reason to go out to meet them. We're kind of funneling them a little bit. So, I mean, again, this is just where Fire Blast is really coming in useful. Four kills right there. <laughs> And we're just going to keep puppy guarding our party here and use Force Bolt. 
knock him into that fire. See, that's that's where that two knockback. You really notice the difference. All right, that was the uh, second hit of our magical armor. He used that line attack again, and this warg charged in. So you can see we're missing one of our ice plates. Still full health though. Get the execution on him. We're actually going to teleport to here. Get some nice meaty damage on you. And I think we can actually keep him here. This guy should prioritize our fairy knight and he's going here. You're frozen. Looking good. Now we can actually do this. Alright, Fairy Knight's pretty safe. We got a lot of Frozens up. Yeah, one hit, that's fine. Ah, uh, Ice Wall expired, so it froze our Bedivere. That's unfortunate. Go ahead and put Bless. Finish you, get a free swing on you. Let's soften him up a little bit so that way our Fairy Knight can actually get the execution on him. Something like this. Very nice. Let's refresh our ice plates and we're actually going to teleport now. Something like here. He now can't reach us, so nice and safe. Doesn't have to worry about risking any damage. We got these tornado things. Bedivere's probably going to take damage here. Nothing we can really do about that. Let's this. Yep, he did that line attack again. We can't mitigate that anymore, so we took some damage there. Gonna go after this spellcaster though. You can see we have teleport back. That's why I like having that double teleport. Go ahead and weaken you. Get the kill. There we go. Execution. Nice. Get rid of those pesky tornadoes. And can't reach him this turn, so I'm just going to shoot a little force bolt at him. Nice and low. Teleport back in. Should be able to get the execution, and there we go, calling hits. And I mean, coming out of that against... An elite spellcaster, two shield guards, a bunch of wargs. Not bad. I mean, Bedivere only took some damage because of the tornado spell, but Fairy Knight, he lost a total of five armor and 11 hit points. It's really not bad by any means. That is the Fairy Knight in action. You can see he's quite flexible. I mean, even though mine is very much so built more towards the tank aspect of his character, he was still doing pretty well in that assassin type moments, you know, teleporting in, getting some kills, and that's why I like to have the double teleport. He can teleport back if necessary. I mean, he got that execution kill, was able to snipe off that spellcaster in that Fomorian fight, and then jump back in and finish off that shield guard. In the picked fight, he was able to wall for the party very well, especially since the party I brought was very debuff CC focused, so they couldn't run past him and the attacks made at him I think ate like two shield plates and then the rest were just dodged on the flip side against the Fomorians they did make their way past his defense with AoE attacks so if you are bringing him as an off tank or a tank like I did for that mission you just have to be very careful and selective and just aware of what you're going against so that way he doesn't get burnt down by just a bunch of AoEs getting thrown at him. 
With all that said, I hope you enjoyed, were entertained by seeing what the Fairy Knight could do. Maybe this was helpful to you in your own playthrough, deciding how you want to build your own Fairy Knight. Let me know what you think, which kind of playstyle you prefer, how you're going to build him. Do you like him more as a tank, off-tank, or as an assassin? Or also kind of maybe that sort of middle ground that mine does a little bit of. If you made it to the end of the video, th thanks for watching.